Uh, let me ask you about, you, you're, you and Groucho are very good friends. I'm Groucho's secretary. That's right. Now let me ask you this. This is the euphemism of the year. <laughs> Welcome to the Marx Brothers Council Podcast, episode 74, We Need to Talk About Eric. As always, the sound you don't hear in the background is our producer Bob Cassell twiddling his knobs in semi-darkness. I'm Matthew Conium, and with me is a man who is not only Noah Diamond, but is also my co-host. It's my co-host, Noah Diamond. What a ridiculous name. <laughs> Happy to be with you as always, Matthew. It's been said so often that this is one of the best times ever to be a Marx Brothers enthusiast that it is rapidly becoming a truism. The explosion in recent years, both of newly accessible material and of new knowledge, has been virtually unprecedented. And no doubt many listeners are being reminded of that as we record at the end of October 2024, as they make their way through Robert Bader's newly published biography of Zeppo. One of the things that gives me most pleasure is the way in which the council and council adjacent projects have been able to contribute to this broadening of knowledge. But just as important as this expansion of, as it were, raw knowledge of new facts, the widening of the horizontal axis, has been the lengthening of the vertical axis. That is to say, increasing not just the breadth of our knowledge, but the depth with which we interpret it. The two projects need not be mutually exclusive, of course. Bader's Zeppo, for instance, is a very good example of a work which does both, thanks to the relative mysteriousness of its central figure hitherto. Just as important, though, is the task of deepening our perceptions of what may seem to be the settled science of the Marx story. So often when we cautiously rake over the surface of, a, of long accreted certainty, we find a topsoil of uninterrogated myth and legend concealing a radically different core. Sometimes, as we found when we went digging into the humor risk legend, the most unexpected genies emerge from the bottle. But the process remains just as valuable when the discoveries are slight or partial or subtle, or when they help to put new flesh on old skeletons without ever threatening earlier conclusions. I'm proud, for instance, of the role we played in the deepening of consensus on the status of Richard Ennobly and the Marx Brothers scrapbook, and the modification of the old idea that he was some kind of mercenary opportunist who exploited our hero cynically and for financial gain. The kind of vitriol his name would unleash online is vastly rarer now. Another, whose name is often received much as Dracula receives an order of garlic mushrooms, is Erin Fleming. In fact, she may be the ultimate test case for this whole project of deepening and illuminating, so heinous are the offences of which she stands accused in the court of Groucho fandom. Indeed, there may be no other figure in the whole Marx saga who is painted in such mercilessly one-dimensional hues. Nonetheless, in recent years, it has become more common for fans to acknowledge that she was clearly not some wicked Disney stepmother, but a woman who had enormous personal problems, which she battled all her life, and that her offences should be viewed more sympathetically through that prism. It's worth remembering, after all, that the revelations concerning her extreme behaviour have been made in many cases by people with only partial or superficial access to her, and have been balanced by the testimonies of others who saw a different, more layered personality. Friend of the podcast, John Tefteller, for instance, while he does not doubt that many of the stories about her bad behavior are true, nonetheless never encountered anything of the sort himself. Bader reminds us that Zeppo, who generally loathed the push to make Groucho a geriatric superstar that she was so much an engineer of, was nonetheless firmly in her corner as far as her personal influence on him went. The Jay Hopkins interview with her, accessible in our archives, though recorded as late as 1979, reveals an almost shockingly intelligent and reflective personality. And it's also worth remembering that much of the most disturbing testimony concerning her came to light in the worst possible conditions for calm and rational analysis, as the collateral damage in a bitter court battle over Groucho's conservatorship. It shouldn't be controversial to note that these are not the sort of events that lend themselves to restraint and sobriety as far as mudslinging goes, yet such is Erin's reputation that I suspect I will have alienated some listeners already, simply by urging caution. What we need, clearly, is more to go on, is more depth, and that can only come via the testimony of more people with personal acquaintance of the individuals and events involved. That's why I'm delighted to welcome our guest this month. His name is David Fleming. David, welcome, and can I ask you to tell us what your personal connection to all of this is? Well, uh, thank you, Matthew, for inviting me to your podcast, and uh, my personal connection with Erin uh, was uh, she was my aunt, my uh, father's sister, 
And uh, she had uh, three other brothers. Her eldest brother was Ross. Her second brother was my father, Russell. And her third and youngest brother, who was younger than her, was Richard, or who we like to call Dickie. And uh, I met Aaron on a number of occasions, both with Groucho Marx and before Groucho Marx. And uh, I know uh, quite a bit about her and um, her antics. So how well did you, did you know her as, as, you were, as you were growing up? Did you see her often? I saw her uh, maybe every couple, two or three years, I would see her. Uh, when I first met her, uh, we were living in Niagara-on-the-Lake. And um, that is a little town or hamlet just across uh, Niagara Falls. And uh, Erin at the time was living in New York City with her boyfriend at the time, who was always, she was always very interested in older Jewish men. And so uh, she was living with a Papa Bush, as she called him. And he was a lawyer who worked uh, in New York. And uh, she was living basically with him and off of him. And uh, she was trying to make it as an actress um, on Broadway. And it was through her connections in Broadway that she met a guy named Jerry Davis, who uh, introduced her to Groucho. So uh, she flew out to uh, Los Angeles and had the brazen gall to... uh, get on like a tour bus and scope out his mansion, uh, then taking a cab over and and like pushing the uh, intercom and introducing herself uh, as a friend of Jerry Davis and would he please meet her. And uh, he opened the gate and let her in and, you know, the rest is history. Do you know, was that then just entirely uh, an accident of circumstance that that she just happened to, to, to get that? that entree or, or was this something that she she was sort of angling for previously i mean was was were the marx brothers or groucho an interest of hers do you know prior to that opportunity arising i don't think so i think it was more just an uh, a uh, an action of opportunity as you suggest and uh, she was um trying to make it in hollywood um and in more specifically in new york city at the time and i guess uh you know, she was getting small acting roles uh, off Broadway and uh, basically living off of Papa Bush and then um, got this uh, referral through Jerry Davis to uh, Groucho and she flew out there and uh, everything else I said is how she met him. I believe he answered the intercom. This is the legendary Groucho Marx. <laughs> and uh, she went into her, uh, you know, uh, sugar-coated introduction on the intercom and asked if she could meet him. And he let her in and they met in his uh, mansion at the back, uh, which I was also in. And I guess uh, he saw something in her that uh, reminded him of, in my view, his mother, Minnie. Um, But also, there were other kind of weird circumstances. For example, his brother Harpo was married to a Susan Fleming and also had a first girlfriend who was killed in a plane accident whose name was Jen Fleming. So the name Fleming uh, sort of resonated with Groucho and... um, you know, she was 35. She wasn't bad looking, I suppose. I'm not a best judge of that. She was my aunt. But um, he liked her. And uh, especially, I think he was fond of her uh, drive and um, her um, willingness to take risks and, and, and tell people what she thought of them up front, whether it be big wig Hollywood producers or you know, the uh, coach, driver, and the chef. So um, we uh, were invited, I guess the first time I met Groucho was in 1972 when uh, he took her to a horse race and she won 800 bucks. 
and uh, she paid for our flights on American Airlines out there. And uh, we stayed in her house uh, in West Hollywood. But every morning we'd go over to Groucho's and I met all kinds of stars uh, like Barbara Streisand, Elliot Gould, and uh, many others. And uh, I was living in his daughter's uh, bedroom, essentially. <laughs> uh, but I, we would go back and forth between West Hollywood and... Uh, I'd be swimming in his pool and what have you. We had a fondness for black cats, both of us. He took a shine to me. He liked me and uh, liked to crack jokes and play the piano and have me sing. And I was always off tune. And uh, he said, David, you know, you sound like my brother Harpo. And that's why you never spoke. <laughs> <laughs> so um, he was very elderly when I first met him, I guess, um, 82 or 83, and uh, she was, I'm thinking, 35 or 36. And uh, the first time that I met her there, she wasn't completely off her rocker. The second time we went in 1974, it was clear to me, even as a 10-year-old boy, that uh, she was suffering from uh, some serious mental illness difficulties. But it, it's not something that um, surprised me, uh, frankly, Matthew, because my family suffers from something that we call the Fleming curse, which is um, degenerative brain disease that sort of grips and hopscotches across generations and uh, picks a few unlucky few. And uh, the generation that preceded me, uh, including Aaron, my father, and her brothers, were all gripped by uh, the Fleming curse. She was the worst by far, but the others weren't uh, too sane either. So, um, yeah, that's how I met Groucho and her. So just to backtrack briefly then, in, in the the years that you knew her before she encountered Groucho, were you aware that, you know, the, the signs of a, of a later odd behavior were already there? Or was it something that came as more of a surprise to you later on? Well, I'll tell you a story. Um, the first time I met her, I was like four and I was living in Niagara-on-the-Lake. And she was invited over. We were in a little apartment. My father was a teacher at, in Virgil. My mother was uh, also um working as a, a teacher and uh, she was staying with me and uh, yeah, she was uh, not very friendly. She uh, seemed uh, almost jealous of me. You know, I, my father was always sort of concerned about her and in the end it led to his demise. You know, the first time I met her, uh, she would come into the bathroom while I was in the tub and, uh, you know, carry on in her sort of bizarre way and, and make, you know, cracks and jokes and what have you. And so uh, I thought it was perfectly all right. My father always walked around naked in front of me that I went into her bedroom when she was changing, which she took great exception to. And uh, so then my father dragged me out and spanked me in front of her. And uh, I wasn't too happy about that. And she was smiling and had a big grin on her face. And so I can say honestly that the two of us really didn't get along too well. But um, I was interested in meeting Groucho Marx and James Cagney and Elliot Gould. So you go with the flow. You mentioned earlier that, that she had other examples of kind of father figure, um, older, older male relationships. Um, what do you think when when she um, when she first met Groucho? Obviously, she couldn't have imagined that it would lead to the the, the extraordinary uh, state of affairs that it, that it did in terms of her responsibility and her influence. So, what what do you think she was hoping to get out of it? Did you did she just think it would be somebody who would be very useful to her in, in pursuing her acting career? Well, I think that she's correctly characterized as a gold digger, right? Um, 
And uh, I'd say that, yes, she saw him as a, uh, a means to an end in getting her into an acting career in Hollywood, but he was also a really rich guy. And uh, she came from a family of, uh, well, you know, her father was Dr. Russell Fleming. Um, he was a, a GP, a general practitioner in New Liskert, Ontario. And he was sort of a big, big fish in a little pond the big deal and and they were sort of the they had more money than the others and um uh, he sent her down to toronto to havergal college and she was expelled from there and um father figures um i feel that my grandfather who i never met so i can't really speak a lot about him but i do know that he survived world war one he was in a the Canadian Battalion, the Hamilton Battalion. He fought in battles like uh, Vimy Ridge and Passchendaele, and he suffered from PTSD. And so when he had these four children and who were all hooligans, he preferentially treated her because she was his daughter. Now, the boys, on the other hand, <laughs> they didn't fare so well, but uh, she was always treated with kid gloves. And um, so perhaps that was why she um, she had this sort of father figure uh, fetish. And just one very small point that you, that you are you will be able to settle. Um, possibly you, you you're not even aware that this is a, a, an issue, um, which is her her age. Um, Steve Stolia, who's probably written the most about her, um, always felt that she was quite a bit older than she claimed to be. Uh, but you but you you say no, she was in her thirties at, at the time she was with Groucho, rather than her forties. That's for definite. That's correct. Yeah. Were you already a Marx Brothers fan before you before you met him? No, I'd never heard of them before. Really? Um, and um, I was only an eight-year-old boy. I was going to uh, a private school in Toronto. And I came home one night and was having dinner with my father and my mother. And my father announced that uh, Aaron had uh, landed a job with the famous Groucho Marx. And I basically said, well, who's he? <laughs> And he said he's a, a famous, you know, comedian who liked to make fun of societal norms. And uh, they did a sort of vaudeville uh, a routine on film, and they were very funny, but they were also quite outrageous. And uh, so then I started becoming very curious about it, and uh, my father would take me to a place called OISE, Ontario Institute for Studies and Education, where he worked. And they would have movies there. And uh, some of the movies were Marx Brother movies. And so we would go and see them. And then I became uh, familiar with the Marx Brothers at that time. So without any knowledge of the, of the sort of intermediate stages of his career, then it, presumably the contrast was all the more shocking between the Groucho that you saw on screen and the, and the frail man that you then met. Not really. Uh, Groucho was still, uh, he may have been frail and elderly, but he still had a sharp tongue. He uh, was uh, quick with uh, his um, insults and um, his uh, outrageous uh, kind of behavior, even as an old man. And I thought it was very funny um, as a boy. I still do. But I think it shocked a lot of people that were around him. Um, some people uh, found it very funny, and other people less so. For example, I met Arthur, and I met, um, I believe it was Marion, and uh, neither of them were really, they didn't get along with him too well. Uh, Miriam better, um, but uh, Arthur... You know, the first time I met Arthur, I was um, in in Groucho's um, Beverly Hills mansion, and he had a, sort of a driveway that, that had a fountain in the middle. So it was kind of like a roundabout with a gate that uh, kept uh, the undesirables out because there were tour buses coming by all the time. And uh, they were viewing different uh, stars, homes, 
and they would stop by Groucho's house. And I was out on my skateboard and the, this uh, Mercedes came in. I was skating around on, on my skateboard that my aunt had bought me as I had arrived. It was a GNS skateboard. And Arthur came out and said, who are you? And I said, well, I'm David Fleming. I'm Aaron's nephew. And he looked and said, oh, I see. And uh, then his wife at the time, I believe her name was Lois, stiffened right up. And I, I got like a, a sort of a vibe. Uh oh, what's going on here? So I just uh, stuck it out and Arthur went in. I continued skateboarding about literally seven minutes later. He came storming out of the house with his um, wife in tow. And they didn't say anything to me. They just got into the car and took off. And uh, I was like, wow, what's going on? So I went inside and everybody was seated around uh, the living room, sort of like a, a living room at the back. There was a grand piano and it, a, a massive uh, stone fireplace. It was a beautiful home. And um, I said, well, what happened to Arthur? What? Why did he take off like that? And everybody was sort of looking at the floor. Nobody was saying much, not even Groucho. And uh, my aunt went into a, a diatribe about how he was a tennis star and that uh, he had issues with his father and um, that one of his issues with his father was her. She had a big grin on her face as she was telling me all this. And my father basically said to me, David, I want to talk to you. And so he sort of dragged me out by my collar into the pool. And he says, okay, I want you to shut up about this because I don't want any trouble here. We're here to have some fun. We're here to meet Groucho and, and his friends. And I don't want my sister going off. So you just shut up about it. And I said, okay, dad, you know. And so I, I just uh, let it go. I often think that Arthur is probably much more of a, a much more of a causal factor in in this whole saga than than uh, he's he's often uh, portrayed as. Would would you agree, Noah? Yeah, I do agree with that, and I think, um, however one feels about Erin and her influence on Groucho in this period, it's a situation that's possible only because of Groucho's alienation from his children. And, you know, in all the animosity that Aaron gets from fans, um, one of the reasons that, although we can understand the basis for it and sympathize with some of it, one of the reasons it never quite seems fair um, is because she very much walked into a situation that existed before her entrance in a very unstable, we might say toxic state. Partly because Steve Stolier and others have written about Aaron with such compassion, we've and we've heard her interview that Jay Hopkins conducted uh, in 1979 that we released on our podcast. This more sympathetic take on her has emerged, and one of the possible conclusions it suggests to me is that yes, she was obviously unwell, unstable, um, mentally ill. That's that's inarguable. But whatever was wrong with Erin, it seems that the role she assumed at Groucho's house may have exacerbated her worst qualities. She was in a ridiculous situation of having this incredible power and authority in a world full of powerful, much older men. Um, it could not have been easy for her. And at the same time, wielding this power and over Groucho's life, household, and career, she also had to constantly put on this show of being demure and, you know, conventionally f fetching and subjugated to uh, flatter Groucho, which was obviously a big part of her job uh, around there. Um, she says in Hector Arce's book at one point, she says, when I first started working for Groucho, I was very sweet and friendly and everyone loved me and they walked all over me, you know, and that, I mean, I'm paraphrasing. Uh, and so I became a much more difficult person to deal with because I had to. Um, what, did you observe uh, anything that suggested that 
this wasn't just a life for her. She was also doing a job, and it was probably an extremely challenging job for anyone to do. Well, um, yes. I mean, uh, I think that she realized that Groucho had just left his uh, third wife and that he was very depressed. He felt that he was a has-been, I think, that he couldn't, um, he couldn't generate any more interest in himself. And she walks in and starts answering the fan mail and got him uh, an award in France and um, pushed and pushed and pushed in a very harsh manner to uh, get him an Academy Award. And I feel that Groucho felt that she was like his mother, Minnie, in that she was the driving force behind the the Marx Brothers' success. And he recognized that in her. And he thought that this is somebody that in his, even in his old age, he could, um, she could rejuvenate his career just like many had done um, in the vaudeville days. I, I brought a couple of things that I don't know whether you want me to, to read these or not, yeah, but there's please. some correspondence. It's the first letter that we received from Erin. I, I find them kind of funny. I mean, we, we, we received letters from her all the time and postcards and crazed, uh, and, they, and they demonstrate her sort of descent into complete madness. Um, this first one is where what we're talking about, her sort of introduction to uh, uh, Groucho. And it's dated November 9th, 1971. And it says, Don't be confused by the return address on the envelope, as I am still living in my agent's house on Troy Drive. I'm always over here at Groucho's because he has put me on salary to answer his fan mail and to try to get me over here to keep him company. He is paying me $100 per week and all I can eat. He was divorced from his last wife two years ago, and since he is now 81 years old, he is a lot of fun, but that's it. I don't know whether you remember the film Sunset Boulevard, but I could add a few chapters, (laughs) particularly on rainy nights when the two of us sit in the projection room running old Marx Brother movies. He lives in an enormous house on the Truesdale Estates in Beverly Hills, and it looks as if it were decorated on the set designer of an old Gene Harlow movie. I have a bedroom that I keep a lot of stuff in when I stay over here on weekends, and the bathroom attached to it is about 25 feet long and 10 feet wide, and has a 9-foot sunken marble bathtub at one end. Also, a lot of satin draperies over a full-length glass door that leads to a private patio in the pool. It's kind of like having your own private country club. Oh, yes, the bed in my room is a custom-made brown bed with satin sheets, and the walls of the room are covered with beige silk. He lives mostly on the other end of the house, where I communicate with him mainly by phone. I call him from the tub to find out what he's doing, and if he wants to go to the Beverly Hills Hotel for lunch, and a lot of important stuff like that. The house is enormous, and every room has a telephone with an intercom on it, so the maid can call you for meals. Also, all the doors have buzzers as well as the phones. Every time I'm sitting in the bathtub reading a good book, a buzzer goes off. The other day it rang about six times. There are three maids in the house and I figured they must be either asleep or dead. So after the sixth ring, I wrapped the towel around myself and headed for the front door. There I bumped into Groucho who was coming in from the kitchen yelling, What in God's name is buzzing? at which point two maids crossed the hall into the living room, answering separate doors and phones. He never did find out what it was, but it was kind of like a Marx Brothers routine. We have a lot of fun together because he is a scream and I am a giggler. We are uh, very much in demand at dull dinner parties, and I have met every major movie star you can name. It's really quite interesting to go to their homes for dinner. The best party was made up of Walter Matthau and his wife, Paula Prentice, and Dick Benjamin, Alan Arkin, Hot Lips, Sally Kellerman, Goddard Lieberson, the head of CBS, Jack Lemon, and Felicia, and several directors who I am trying to get in good with. As you can see, I'm having a pretty good time. The cook here is fabulous, and it's a wonder I don't weigh a thousand pounds. 
Imagine not having to do a dish or set a table or make a bed or pick up your clothes. This is the life. On sunny days when I don't have any appointments or anything to do, I strip to the buff and lay around in the sun by the pool and usually make the Spanish maid bring me cigarettes and lemonade every five minutes. All my friends are trying to get in good with me like mad because they all want to be invited. I don't even have to buy cigarettes, just tell the housekeeper to order them. The only trouble with the whole setup is that I'm horny as hell and Groucho hasn't been able to get it up for 20 years. (laughs) Thank God I'm queer for old men, but not old men. He just likes to have me around for company and pinches my ass occasionally. Also, he tells me all the stories about the good old days in vaudeville a lot. And since he is the world's greatest living conversationalist, his own description is really quite interesting. He also calls himself a living legend a lot, usually when he answers the phone. Hello, this is Groucho Marx, the living legend. He would love me to move in and live here, but I have no intention of doing that because I would never get late. (laughs) So I go home to my house in the hills during the week and stay over on the weekends. If I don't have a date, actually he is very understanding about the fact that I need to go out with other guys and says as long as I lie to him, he doesn't care what I do. I am very aware of how lucky I am. Just this afternoon, I got a call from an actor I hardly know who came out here to California a couple of weeks ago, checked into some dumpy apartment house, and was held up by a junkie who stole his clothes and all his money. In desperation, he went to the Street Actors Guild and looked up in the Player's Guide to see if there was anyone he could call to borrow a few bucks. He called my agent and explained the situation, and they contacted me. He's going to go to work tomorrow in a job he found in the paper, and in the meantime, I was able to lend him a few bucks to eat on. Hope you enjoy the book I sent you. It's easy reading and should be a collector's item in a few years with that inscription, Love and Kisses Aaron. (laughs) So that's the first letter we got again, uh, 1971. I've got two others that I I will share with you uh, that show more uh, candidly her descent into uh, madness. My father, Russell, felt that she was doing a lot of um, recreational drugs with uh, some of her hippie friends, as well as some of the movie stars who shall go nameless. But I think that it really accelerated her degenerative brain disease, in in my view. And, uh, you know, when you see the the YouTube and uh, the interviews that she's on, um, it's clear to me that she's on something. This next letter is a letter written to to my father, who is constantly on her, constantly phoning her. It's written uh, February 1st, 1988, after the trial. Trial happened in 1983. And then again, there was the appeal, I believe, uh, 85, 86. And my father was constantly nagging her, telling her she needed to stop drinking and what have you. That's the context of this letter. Dear Russell, you are such a fantastic impediment to me. Everything you do is wrong. Everything you do is wrong. What do you want that I have? I will not give it to you. Phone your father yourself, you dumb asshole. Please bugger off. You're a goddamn fucking nuisance and a moron. Do you understand? You are retarded. Get off the phone. Leave me alone. I want you to leave me absolutely alone. Both of us, Aaron and Marilyn, do not even think about me. Say the same thing. I am trying to have a life here, Russell Fleming, and that is none of your goddamn business, you pigsty. Your father may be reached at the House of Lords, London, West England, the United Kingdom. I sent terrific presents to David just to prove that you are retarded, and you thank me for them. Are you brain damaged or what? Can't you think? Lord Lawrence Olivier, don't write to me. Write to him yourself. Don't keep bothering me all the time. Maybe he doesn't want to be bothered with you seeing how you behave and how you've treated me and your mother. And that was the letter from 1988. Wow. So... Uh, The context of this next letter, October 10th, 1994, is from her psychiatrist. 
and my father was paying for her psychiatrist. Erin was in and out of jail, in and out of uh, mental institutions. She was shipped to Florida, where uh, she spent, I think, six months, and then was bussed with $30 in her um, pocket back to uh, California, where she voluntarily, supposedly, booked herself into some of the hospitals there. And again, this is from a Dr. Lawrence R. Moss, Psychiatry, 501 Santa Monica Boulevard, Suite 501. October 10th, 1994, re Aaron Fleming. To whom it may concern, I am writing to you at the request of Ms. Aaron Fleming, for whom I have been providing psychiatric treatment since December 1993 at the Beverly Wood Mental Health Center at 1920 Robertson Boulevard in Los Angeles. Her diagnosis is schizoaffective disorder with elements of both a manic depressive illness and schizophrenia. Ms. Fleming suffered a nervous breakdown, i.e. a psychotic episode, in March of 1992, necessitating 18 months of inpatient treatment. After her condition improved, she came to Beverly uh, Wood uh, Hospital, a voluntary uh, residential treatment center. She is doing uh, fairly well here, though she continues to require uh, daily monitoring by staff, as well as ongoing uh, psychiatric uh, medication treatment with Moban, uh, Nevpoleptic, and Flonopin. If you have any questions, Ms. Fleming has instructed me that you may contact me, uh, Lawrence R. Moss. And so what happened in, in 1992 is that she was talking about killing herself on the phone with my father. And uh, he was saying, if you do that, you will, uh, you'll destroy everyone. Which she did. And... Um, my father also died of um, degenerative brain disease. So it was painful for me to sort of talk about. Um, she was no help. But uh, she had got herself a gun on the street. And um, she was talking about putting a bullet in her head underneath the Hollywood sign. And uh, she walked, he, he convinced her to surrender the weapon, my father. So she marched into the police department in Los Angeles with a loaded, uh, you know, dirty, hairy magnum pistol, slammed it down on the table and says, I want to surrender this weapon. She's immediately surrounded by a SWAT team with rifles pointed at her head and sent uh, to, uh, you know, the, 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 to the clink. And then where she was diagnosed and, and then sent off uh, to Florida. So um, she really descended into, like, she went down the rabbit hole in a big way. You know, the late 80s, she was the worst. In the 90s, she was struggling to find her sanity, and she would come in and out of it. She was fairly lucid, and she came up to see us in, in Toronto. And my father took her around. We went out to dinner at George's Spaghetti House. And uh, there's, again, like lots of jazz stars that you can and talk with there. And uh, she Sorry, when did you say lucid. this was? This is in Toronto. This is about 1990, I'm going to say four, 1994, five maybe, after she was released from hospital. And uh, we were hoping that she was going to remain that way. Of course, that wasn't the way of it because in the end, she did put a bullet in her heart, not her head, um, underneath the Hollywood sign. Well, a tremendous amount to, uh, to sort of digest there. Uh, what, one thing I think um, we should clarify, first of all, in case anybody listening uh, doesn't understand, is both the, the specific meaning and the wider meaning of that reference in one of those letters to Erin and Marilyn. Uh, Marilyn was her real name, wasn't it? That's correct. In fact, Wikipedia has it all wrong. Because Aaron was playing her games with the court, she was named Marilyn Suzanne Fleming upon birth, 
Why she changed her name to Erin is beyond me. But uh, she also changed her middle name to Leslie. I don't know why. But in the 1980s, all the letters that she sent, she was uh, the Catherine de Rothschild. She was married to Bob Guccione. Oh, yes. She was 007 because there were all kinds of uh, people watching her. Apparently, she, she surrounded her windows in tinfoil. She thought that she was being listened to. There were listening devices. So she, she cut all the wires in her condo. And uh, she was completely off her rocker. I think Dick Cavett once described her as the only actress ever to change her name from Marilyn. Yes. Yeah. I, d- I don't understand why, but um, uh, there was something about the name that I, I guess that she liked. Maybe she had met somebody that, that she was admired named Aaron. The reason that she changed her name to Aaron Leslie, I think, is because of the whole court case. Because she was always conniving to try and... Uh, you know, hoping that they had named her incorrectly in court and so that it wouldn't uh, apply, I guess. I don't know. That's my guess. But uh, if you look her up on Wikipedia, she's actually listed as Erin Leslie Fleming, and her, her name was Marilyn Suzanne Fleming upon birth. So I'm presuming the specifically that reference to Erin and Marilyn as if they're two people. She's talking about Marilyn being her her true self, and Erin, she's almost sort of thinking as as a kind of a persona she's adopted. Definitely. Yeah. She had multiple personalities. She, she had disassociative uh, personality disorder. She was schizophrenic and uh, she didn't know who she was. And um, that was following the nervous breakdown that happened following the trial. She knew full well who she was when she was with Groucho, but she had already begun to descend by 1974 into sort of the... Um, Jezebel that everybody uh, portrays her as. And I think that that was um, sort of caused by her um, partaking in various different uh, recreational drugs. I believe that one of the, the chef in the court case said that her purse was a veritable pharmacy. <laughs> I, I wonder if any of the people who defended her in court, of which there were quite a few, I mean, during the conservatorship battle and then later on too um you know there were some fairly high status hollywood people who testified very positively about her in court uh that she was a great um influence on groucho in in various ways and i think um at this point most of us are willing to concede that up to a point at least it is true um did any of those people who defended her in those days ever try to help her during all the years that she was suffering so terribly later? It seems like she was not without allies at a certain point, and then she was very alone after that. Well, I would, I would say that uh, Elliot Gould did. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I would say that one of the nurses in Groucho's uh, employment did. But she also had many, many detractors and haters. And so they really didn't want to put their head on the chopping block so much. Uh, by the end, like in, in, in the 90s uh, and in, in, the, in the late 90s, she was literally a vagabond living on the streets of West Hollywood. When my, and my father went down there many times to try and save her. And... Uh, you know, you know, she was pointing guns at him and stuff. And so I was like, no, thanks. And she uh, didn't do herself any favors in terms of reaching out to people that could help her, that could, uh, uh, you know, maybe that's not entirely fair. She did go to, uh, she, she had a fondness for a priest in a Roman Catholic church in West Hollywood, Monsignor Parnassus. And, um, you know, I'm ashamed to say that uh, she was constantly phoning me and leaving, you know, really vulgar messages on my answering service. And uh, I phoned her up and basically told her, you know, what I was going to do, that I'd be down there myself 
I would take control of the situation and she'd be in a rubber room for the rest of her life if she kept on calling me and, uh, you know, stop this, these antics at once. Stop taking these drugs that you're taking and, you know, smarten up. And uh, she wrote me about two weeks later and saying, if you ever want to speak to me again, speak to me like Monsignor Parnassus. <laughs> How old were you at that point? I was in my late 30s. Uh-huh. Yeah. I, w- I wonder about, uh, and please feel free to pass on this question if you'd like to, but I, I can't help wondering, uh, one of the aspects of Erin's personality that's so clear from so much of what we've read and heard about her is uh, an unusual level of uh, sexual candor and exhibitionism. Um, she clearly wielded that um consistently, even in the letter that you shared with us from 1971, you know, yeah. a letter to her family. She's, it's a little bracing how she just slides right into how horny she is and Groucho can't help her out that way. So maybe, you know, it's, um, it, that really stands out. And I just wonder how that all played in the mind of a young man at the time. I, I mean, you're, this is your relative, your aunt, but it must have also been an introduction to various concepts for you. This must have all been a lot to take in. And just, I wonder if you have any reflection on that. I do. Um, as far as I'm concerned, uh, it was par for the course for me because, uh, like I said, the, the generation that preceded me were all nuts. And they were all that way. And they all talked that way. And they all had those kind of antics. And nudity was like, uh, and, and, and sexual promiscuity were uh, standard par for the course. For example, my father liked to parade his mistresses around in front of me. So uh, not a, I wasn't a big fan of it all. Having said that, I think Groucho was attracted to it and found it funny because uh, like, I, I got another example is th- there's a story about Irving um, Thalberg, I believe. Yeah. Where uh, the Marx Brothers are invited into Thalberg's office. And uh, Thalberg has this habit of saying, hold that thought. Uh, you know, I'll be right back. And he goes to the next office and there's another movie going on. You know, it's got, I don't know, May West or whatever. And he's in there for half an hour. And so the Marx Brothers are all sitting there going, what the hell's going on? And so uh, they decide that they're going to teach him a lesson and they move the filing cabinet in front of his, uh, of Thalberg's door, office door, and he can't get in. So they make him promise that he won't do it again. And so uh, he promises and and they go in and they carry on. And then that lasts about three weeks because the next time they go into his office, off he goes again and disappears. And when he arrives back about two hours later, they're all sitting there naked (laughs) <laughs> with their hogs hanging out and, uh, you know, uh, roasting uh, taters in the fireplace and they're burning all of his books. So uh, Thalberg actually uh, thought it was very funny, sat down, took off his clothes with them, and uh, they sat there uh, talking about the movie and eating uh, roasted taters and he ordered butter from the, the, the director's studio. So I think the Groucho found Aaron's uh, nudity and sexual promiscuity funny. The Marx Brothers certainly had an exhibitionistic streak of their own, no question about that. They also, you know, had alternate identities. I mean, Groucho and Julius brought some pathology to the table, uh, as well as Aaron and, and Marilyn. Absolutely. That's so true, Noah. You're absolutely right. And and maybe that's where all these identities sort of root from with Aaron. I never actually thought of that. But uh, yeah, Groucho was Julius, Harpo was Adolf, you know, wow. And, um, you know, then he was Arthur, and then he was Harpo. And uh, Chico, I believe, was Leonard. And I I can't remember what Zeppo's first name was. Um, Herbert. Herbert. And so they all had these um, alter egos. Clark Kent and Superman, you know. (laughs) 
sticking to the sexual theme there, one of the interesting things about that first letter, I think, is that it clarifies what we had always assumed to be the nature of their physical relationship, such as it was, uh, it was indeed the case, because they both used to like dropping hints that they were, that they were lovers uh, in, in interviews and things. But I think what we all imagined was uh, it was entirely chaste, except to the extent of, you know, Groucho copying the occasional uh, pinch of her ass there. So I think that, that really is exactly what we would have suspected of them, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. I mean, it's like she said in the letter, he was 83 years old. He couldn't get it, hadn't get it, couldn't get it up for 20 years. So he, he just liked to look at, uh, you know, uh, and, and have the attention of a younger pretty woman. What, what is it that he used to say? You're only as young as the woman you feel. <laughs> In the Jay Hopkins interview with her, uh, she she seems to be strongly suggesting that uh, her aggression, her aggressive behaviour, such as it was, um, had a practical purpose, which was that that she she found Groucho as a as a man with virtually no interest in 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 life, who was living entirely in the past, had no get up and go, and she was sort of encouraging him to kind of, uh, well, she actually says rage against the dying of the light. She actually quotes the the, the, the uh, yes. Dylan Thomas poem, doesn't she? Um, this this element of 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 aggression obviously is is. The, the the main kind of charge against her in terms of her relationship with Groucho in your um, experience of of seeing them together, um, you know what did you make of of their interaction? Were you aware of any particular power dynamic, and were you aware of Erin being very much uh, you know very seriously in control of him? The first time I met them in 1972, I would say no. Uh, I felt that she had more of a role as an employee. He was kind of sweet on her, liked to spend time with her, liked to go out to, you know, the hall, the, the Beverly Hills uh, clubs and restaurants. And, and um, But by 1974, the second time I saw them, he had aged significantly by that time and almost looked to her as uh, what should I do? What what should I say? Um, help me here. And uh, she knew, I think, that uh, he had had this kind of vision of her as the the uh, reincarnation of his mother, and all the all the different uh, books uh, and. Um, I guess memoirs, for example, in Harpo Speaks, he, he, he talks about his, his mother being very funny, very quick with wit, an absolute taskmaster of, of the children, and uh, like the fear. Whereas his father was, you know, a um, incompetent tailor, but just a lovely man with a smile on his face that everybody loved. So, I think that uh, Groucho, by the end of his life, viewed Aaron as the reincarnation of his mother, and she knew it and took advantage of it. That mini angle is so interesting, and it's although it's mentioned in the literature here and there, particularly the idea that Groucho, at the late point in his life, would gravitate toward a kind of aggressive woman pushing him on stage and encouraging him to, you know, um, to be an act. Uh, that does seem like, oh, yeah, that makes perfect sense. His life was kind of bookended by these stage mothers. Um, but one one insight I haven't heard until this conversation with you is that other people noticed this, too, that uh, people at the time said Aaron reminded them of Minnie. Um, that suggests that it's not just the role that she played in Groucho's life and career at the time, but maybe there were things about her personality, her affect, the way she presented, that was reminiscent of Minnie to people who knew Minnie. That's very interesting. And, you know, I think all Marx Brothers fans fantasize about knowing a little, knowing Minnie a little better. I mean, she's such a giant, legendary figure, but she's like the great Jewish mother in the sky. Like, we don't really have our arms around the real person she was. 
uh, Robert Bader has helped shine a lot of light on her um, in his writing, but but still, like we've never heard a recording of Minnie's voice, you know, we've never seen video of her. Um, she's kind of distant and unknowable in history. Um, I wonder if there is some key to understanding Minnie in Aaron. You know, it's certainly noticeable when I, I just listened in preparation for this podcast. Uh, it sounds like you did too, Matthew. I re-listened to the Jay Hopkins conversation with Aaron. And, you know, just listening to Aaron's voice, she has a very distinct kind of sing-song delivery. Um, it, she speaks in kind of prosy sentences, um, a sort of... Uh, I don't know, a sort of affected sophistication to the way she speaks that might be endearing or annoying depending on, on the moment or, or how you feel about her. I don't know that, that Minnie had that in common with her. We imagine Minnie with a much more of a European kind of sounding voice and affect. But um, I wonder how much there is there. Steve Stolier, too, in his audiobook, he impersonates Aaron and, you know, sounds very much the way she sounds um, in the Jay Hopkins interview and elsewhere. I wonder just it, the impact of her personality, aside from what she was saying and doing. Was she a warm person? Was she charismatic and likable? She could be Noah. She could pour on the charisma. Uh, if she dolled herself up, she could be very charming and uh, very gregarious, very outgoing, but then inexplicably a switch would throw. Somebody might say something that set her off. Something might happen. Maybe there's a smell in the air that reminds her of something and she would go off half cocked out of the blue. And so, uh, I don't know if Minnie was like that. Uh, yeah. I think Minnie was more, um, I think that she was also very charming, very funny. I think Minnie was very gregarious as well. Very beautiful woman too. And um, she, she just, she knew that uh, the networking thing, she knew how to drive, you know, every, all the, all of her sons talk about her as this person that uh, was the uh, sort of, root cause of their success that without her they would have wouldn't have been who they are and so Aaron I think had that to her but as time went on sort of the Fleming curse took hold and uh, she became less and less like like Minnie it was like after his death she became uh, completely insane it's interesting how many of the same qualities, you know, like we sort of, Minnie, Minnie's ruthlessness is celebrated, you know, um, and Minnie's drive and ambition and single uh, self-interested determination to succeed, you know, well, these are the same quality. I mean, Aaron had these qualities too. I, now, I'm not saying there's no difference, um, you know, I mean, obviously these are complicated people. But it's just interesting and, and somewhat instructive. Also, I mean, the last word on Erin often is that she was abusive, you know. Uh, well, she was abusive, um, physically, verbally, um, you know, and that uh, abusive is often a word that can end a conversation right away. Well, if someone was abusive, then that's that. They're a monster, and and, and what else is there to say about them? Um, but, you know, I've certainly read credible arguments that Minnie also was abusive in some ways. You know, Minnie had Definitely. her... Her cruelties, and Groucho was a particular victim of, of Minnie's cruelties. Mm. Yeah, she didn't. She, she Harpo was uh, Minnie's favorite, and Groucho was often uh, the um, butt of her jokes and insults. I think Frenchie fared what the the, the, the poorest. Um, she often would chase him around with the broom in front of the kids who would be cowering in the closet and laughing and snickering. Um she, but she was a hard driver too. But I don't think that she was uh, um, abusive and vulgar yeah. like uh, like Aaron became in the end. Mm, yeah. 
but could be very very cutting is it harpo i think isn't it that tells uh says that very often in company uh she would be you know a very charming hostess and so on and then when when everyone had gone she would do these very merciless impersonations of them and and uh, and generally uh you know take the piss out of them in a, in every uh, conceivable way so she obviously had that kind of sharpness of mind that we associate particularly with groucho and i think to some extent by extension also with erin definitely I 100% agree with you, Matthew, and, and I, I think that Aaron knew that. I think that Aaron slowly realized that um, Groucho viewed her as somebody that was like his mother, somebody that could reinvigorate his career even in his dying days. You know, like his, uh, like his mother, and also unlike his previous wives, who uh, he had a constant problem in that he couldn't he couldn't verbally spar with them he would either just cause offense or they just wouldn't they'd say oh you know let it go groucho you know but here suddenly was a woman who could match him line for line yes <laughs> it's true having said that though it does uh uh strike me as interesting that several of groucho's uh former wives had substance abuse problems of their own. And so they were self-medicating to um, manage their emotions around his sharp tongue. And uh, maybe my aunt was the same, I don't know. I mean, I, was, I only saw them uh, together for, and the second time I saw them in 1974, if you can believe it, I got the chicken pox. <laughs> yeah, this is actually a funny story that I will share with you. So I, 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 I was in uh, Melinda's bedroom, his youngest daughter, I believe, yeah. for a week, recovering with chicken pox. And the nurses were all looking after me. And there was one that took a real shine to me. And I was so bored. I was so pissed off with myself for catching it that I, I, I couldn't believe it. I'd, I'd wanted to see Groucho Marx again and, and Elliot Gould and all those people. Like the last time I'd, I got I got to go to um, all kinds of different uh, acts and, 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 and meet all kinds of different uh, movie stars. I did get to go the second time in 1974 to James Cagney's March of Dimes dinner, but I knew that there was something wrong because I had a terrible headache. I had a bit of a fever and I wasn't feeling well at all. And the next day after that, that, that dinner... I woke up with uh, these chicken pox all over me. And so I sat in, in Melinda's room for a week and I was so depressed. And I decided that I was going to come hell or high water, at least get one last glimpse of Elliot Gould, who I knew was coming over. And so uh, I snuck out of my room uh, when none of the nurses were around and I, I marched down um, the hall and, uh, you know, peeked my head around the corner to see Groucho sitting uh, with Aaron, my parents and Elliot Gould talking uh, about me. And Groucho was saying, my God, David what has done what I have been trying to do for, the, for my entire career. And he's infected all of Hollywood in one single night. <laughs> so that was, uh, that was, yeah, another, I, I snuck back to my room. They never knew that I, uh, that I, I overheard that, uh, conversation, but, um, Wow, I mean, everyone has a story about when they had the chicken pox, but not everyone has an original <laughs> Groucho Marx wisecrack about it. That's incredible. So I had a really good time meeting with Groucho. I loved him dearly. I thought he was a very kind man. He was very kind to me. He had a sharp tongue. That was, and he he used to insult me even. Like I said, you know, he compared me to Harpo when I sang. But uh, he was also very uh, endearing and kind. And um, the last time I saw him, it's another fun story. I uh, was, I had basically recovered from the chicken pox and I wanted something to remember him by. And so I asked the nurse if I could go into his room because she said I was no longer infectious and uh, get him to sign an autograph for me. 
And so I, I marched into his room, which was just right down the hall from mine. And he was in his like automatic bed looking at watching the TV. And I had a, an American dollar bill. And I asked him if he would sign it uh, for me as Groucho Marx. And he looked at me and said, what are you, boy? Like some kind of doomsday? Like, first of all, you come to my house. You've got chicken pox. You're almost infecting me. And now you want me to uh, sign a dollar bill? You don't, you know, it's a federal offense to uh, you just sign a, a dollar bill. He's, it, it's so that he, he looked at me. I was sort of downtrodden and sad, sort of. Uh, and I was leaving his room and he said, come back here. And he got himself up very slowly out of his bed. And he pulled a poster out of a, um, it was a Night at the Opera poster. And he, he pulled it out of a, uh, like one of those cardboard cylinders. And he picked up like a magic marker Sharpie pen. And he was doing a, like a, I don't know, um, a long autograph it had a note to me it says something to the effect of you know i want to see you again david come back uh bring your dog samson because i always talked about my dog samson uh, uh, who was a boxer and he can meet blackie my cat and um as i was watching him his tongue was hanging out and i was thinking to myself my god he's so old and um he managed to get the whole thing. He, he tucked it back in the cylinder and uh, he gave me a hug. And, and then that was it. That was the last time I saw him. Wow. Wow. Do you still have the poster? I do. It's framed. So the, the serious allegations of physical mistreatment of Groucho, presumably you were made aware of them the same time the world was via, via the, the reports at the, at the times of the, uh, the, the court case. Can you remember when you, when you first read that and and how much or how much not of a surprise it came to you my recollection of that was uh during the trial and um specifically uh where she had told one of the private eyes to take out a bunch of syringes and uh medicine bottles of uh, barbiturates and uh, tranquilizers and throw them down a sewer or bury them in the backyard or, or, or something of that nature. And uh, m- both my father and I thought that she wasn't actually injecting Groucho with them, but she was injecting herself. She was stealing the drugs for herself. Um, and that that's why she was trying to get rid of them. But, you know, there were people that testified in court that she did, uh, you know, inject him with uh, tranquilizers so that she could go off and, to, on, on a date and get laid. And so um, there's no doubt in my mind that she was uh, abusive verbally. Uh, she was abusive verbally to me. I have another story that I could tell you on that one, but, uh, you know, uh, as far as grow, I never saw her hit him, but I, I saw her give it back to him verbally, most certainly. Yeah. And he liked it. (laughs) He would, he would look at me and go, isn't she wonderful? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, well, this is another another part of this is that uh, Groucho's relationship with Aaron has to be seen in the context of his relationships with women. I mean, we've talked about his mother, um, and you, Matthew, raised the point that his relationship with Aaron had interesting differences from uh, all three marriages, too. But, you know, Groucho consistently had a hard time relating to women, interacting with women um, on on an equal footing. Um, I think, you know, there's a certain point at which um, abuse feels like love because that's the thing we have an ability to extract from the people around us, um, a a kind of um, harshness of of attention. Um, uh, I I wonder when, when you hear... Marx Brothers fans talking about her, and I think we became aware of you because you started posting on Facebook, sometimes with these very sort of kind, measured, 
counterpoints to the things that people posted, Marx Brothers fans posted about Aaron. And um, I think the, the impulse to defend her a little bit while also being, you know, perfectly clear-eyed about her, her flaws and liabilities is, is very admirable and shows the kind of humanism that we're trying to apply to some of these decades-old legends. Um, how do you feel uh, when, when you hear, for example, Marx Brothers fans speaking about her in, in very derogatory ways? Um, it, that must give you a very conflicted feeling. Yes, it does, Noah. Um, I, you know, she was my aunt and she was my blood. Yeah. And so, uh, I don't want, uh, people to, uh, say things that are perhaps untrue or, uh, even slanderous about her. I haven't really heard that so much. But when you when you said that I posted on Facebook, I, I did get one comment that I just sort of ignored. It was basically the, some guy saying that uh, I have absolutely no interest in people's confused lives. I'm not even, you know, uh, don't want to read any of this. And I'm thinking to myself, well, then why are you posting? You know, like, right. you know so uh, I I feel uh, sympathy and uh, toward her, but at the same point in time. She was a bitch. There was no doubt about it. And we didn't get along either. I was going to tell you one other story that I was. Um, so the first time I met Elliot Gould was at Groucho Marx's house. And he came marching in with these two guys that uh, had a, like salesman bags with them. And so... Groucho and I uh, went with them, uh, at, with Elliot, to the back. I was fascinated because Elliot Gould was on the front of, I believe, Life magazine or Time magazine or whatever because of his role in MASH as, was it Trapper John? And so I, I, I thought, oh, he's a movie star. And so these two salesmen that were behind him were, were Panasonic or Kodak or whatever the uh, automatic cameras of the dem, the, the ones that uh, develop right in front of your face. Uh, Polaroid. Yeah. Polaroid. And so uh, the salesman um, was showing us, he pulled all these cameras out of his bag, and my father was a, a camera fanatic, loved cameras. And uh, these guys were taking pictures and then fanning them, and these photographs would uh, develop right in front of our face. And we were all amazed. It was like magic. And and they wanted Groucho to uh, speak on their behalf as like a, a testimonial, I guess, um, in one of their advertisements or their marketing campaign or what have you. And so they decided to excuse themselves to the back office. But as they left, the salesman looked at me and handed me one of the cameras and said, you look like uh, you'd like this, David. This camera's yours now. Go and take some pictures. I was so thrilled. I was, I was, I just, I couldn't believe it. You know, I got this free camera. And so I was taking pictures around uh, the house and my aunt came marching around the corner, grabbed the camera from me and said, that's mine. And she stripped me from it. And I said, wait a second, the, the, the sales rep gave it to me. And she said, don't you give me any lip, you know, da, da, da. And I, you know, remember what my father said. I don't want my sister going off half cocked, let it go. And so I just zipped my mouth. But I went and uh, I complained to my father about it afterwards. And uh, he went and stole the camera back from her and gave her uh, a, a piece of his own mind in front of everyone else around, uh, you know, being so selfish. And uh, she definitely had a selfish, bitchy um, kind of uh, demeanor. And uh, even with small children. So we didn't get along too well. <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, but you walked out of there with a bunch of Polaroid pictures you took at Groucho's house, huh? I did. Yep. <laughs> That's something. One That's... I took of her. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's not nothing. Yeah, it, it was good. Yeah, we. I had a really good time at Groucho's. He, he had a movie theater at his back, uh, in the back, and, and he would always put on movies for me of, of his different uh, 
movie. So I got to sit there and eat popcorn and watch all of his movies. It was just so terrific. And he had a pool that I got to swim in every morning. He had a black cat that I adored named Blackie. And the two of us, he would love to like tinkle on the piano and we would play and sing together. It was fun. It was really fun. Um, but uh, the way things turned out wasn't so fun. Was uh, Would you say that Groucho was an influence on you? I mean, you were a kid. Was Did it open a world of either interest in show business or was there anything about his personality that sort of um, that you kept with you um, as, as just kind of uh, in addition to just him being a star and a legend and all that, just being an older person who was an influence on you in your younger years? Definitely. Um, you know, uh, after I had watched all of his movies, I went back to Toronto and I would be in, in school and I would say, I'd be bragging that I had met, you know, the, the famous Groucho Marx. And all of my uh, nine-year-old compatriots would say, well, who the hell is he? <laughs> like, I didn't know who he was. So I would get very impatient. And I would start quoting him. You know, I, I, I had all of his uh, sort of one-liners kind of memorized. <laughs> and I used them as stinging rebukes to some of my detractors. Um, <laughs> and uh, so he was definitely a... Uh, a source of inspiration for me. That's beautiful. It's also worth uh, worth noting for everyone who complains that kids these days have never heard of the Marx Brothers. <laughs> There's a bunch of kids in Canada in the early 70s. Groucho's still alive. They didn't know who he was either. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. I mean, uh, a lot of people don't know who he is. And to this day, it shocks me. Um, uh, but that, I think, is what really bothered Groucho was um, in the sort of twilight of his life that people had forgotten him. And therefore, he was vulnerable to somebody that would uh, act as a taskmaster like his mother, Minnie, because he wanted that adoration. He wanted that... Uh, recognition. He liked being famous and he liked being recognized on the street and he liked signing autographs and it was fun for him. And when Aaron would take him to uh, all the different University of Berkeley or whatever, and they'd be having movie night and, and people would be swarming around him, he just found it fantastic. And uh, so she did reinvigorate his career at the end of his life. But she was also abusive, undoubtedly. And it's so, interesting, isn't it? Because we the, the kind of the standard account of uh, of his life paints his first three marriages as being, uh, you know, it, 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 driven entirely by him and and the three women as as being just utterly passive. And then suddenly here it switches and, and we're encouraged to see him as totally passive uh, in the face of, of this. But it, obviously it had to be a two-way thing. And, and you know, he had, to, he had to want to get out of it what he was getting out of it. Otherwise, he, just, he, he would have just pulled up the shutters, wouldn't he? That's right. He would have told her to bugger off. Yeah. There was something about her that uh, he found endearing. And he liked... Um, you know, uh, her going off half-cocked on Hollywood big shots. I think that um, he had his own issues with some of the producers and Hollywood people that he didn't get along with so well. And so he would purposely introduce her to them, <laughs> you know, and she would go off and he would sit in the corner and snicker and uh, find it all very amusing. And... Uh, he could passively watch as somebody else was uh, throwing the bombs. There is some positive legacy here too, isn't there? In in the perpetuation of Groucho as a legend and an icon, um, she was a, an early adopter uh, uh, in that sense, you know, and. Um, Groucho Marx Productions it can be said to be a legacy of hers. She was once a half owner and I believe founder, and that entity lives on. Her representatives in court argued that Groucho Marx um, 
T-shirts and posters uh, were her idea that she was the first person to market those things. I haven't verified that, but it kind of sounds like it that at least could be true. She certainly was uh, at the spearhead of the effort to to market him uh, during that period. And uh, it, to, to the extent that we think that's a positive thing, um, she deserves some of the credit for it. Uh, I agree with you, Noah. I think that that's true. And, and, and so... When you say, does it bother me, to, to go back to your question to me around, does it bother me around uh, people saying that she was a Jezebel? Well, not really, because it's true. But on the other hand, uh, there's another side, to, there's two sides to every coin. And uh, she uh, did reinvigorate his career. And um, she did drive him in a rather abusive fashion. And so... Uh, but he liked it. This is the bottom line. He always would say when she would go off, isn't she wonderful? <laughs> and uh, he'd often, uh, uh, you know, compare her to Minnie. And uh, he also would mention Susan Fleming, Harpo's wife, as uh, somebody that he just adored. And so... I, I think he was just willing to um, let her abusive actions pass on on uh, most occasions. There was a couple occasions though where uh, he let her know that he didn't uh, didn't like her antics and like. Um, let me think here. There was one in particular that I heard about from my father, where it was her birthday. I don't know, thirty eighth birthday or whatever. And she had this great big birthday party planned. And uh, that night he had a stroke. And he was slurring his words and he, he's having trouble uh, communicating. And she walked in to discover all these nurses around him. She asked what was going on. They said that he's had a stroke, that the birthday party's canceled. And she went into a tirade over her birthday being ruined and slamming doors and fuck this and da da da. And uh, he was wheeled over by one of the nurses to her office where he kicked the door open and said, get out. And uh, she did. Then, on the other side of that coin, when Arthur had her removed as conservator and it was on the news, uh, they tried to, to shield him from that. But it is my understanding, I mean, I wasn't there, but uh, hearing from the, the likes of the nursing staff and, and Gould and what have you, that he was very upset to learn that uh, Arthur had removed her as conservator and almost demanded that they come to interview him because he did not want his son to be conservator. He wanted anyone other than Arthur. And so um, he wanted Aaron too. And so I, I think that uh, people knew that he was being abused and taken advantage of. And so she wasn't going to become conservator again. And then so they, they got um, somebody who had worked with him on one of his movies, I believe. Uh, Perrin, Nat Perrin. Nat Perrin. Yeah. And uh, uh, he he became the conservator for, for a time. And then I believe his son for or something like that became a conservator for about six weeks. Yeah, his grandson Andy, I believe. And, and then uh, Groucho died. How did you remember hearing about his death? Uh, how did that affect you? I heard about his death um, in the Toronto Star newspaper. And it was uh, splashed on the entertainment section. And uh, it was, you know, it was really sad for me. I felt really badly. And on the other hand, I, I knew that he was very elderly. And I had watched him on... Um, get his uh, Academy Award. And it was very interesting to me, to, too. Like, he was slurring his words. It was clear he'd had 
multiple strokes. And yet in the same speech, he mentioned both his mother, Minnie, and my aunt. Yeah. And to me, I think that that speech was written and practiced with her by my aunt, that my aunt purposely put herself into that comparison. And uh, he was forced to memorize it or did memorize it. And, you know, he got his Academy Award and um, he was very proud of that. I don't think he was as proud of the Academy Award as he was of the one from the Cannes Film Festival. He had this kind of um, medallion that he wore and uh, he's loved that medallion. And it sat proudly on his trophy chest unless he went to like the James Cagney dinner and he had it on, right? So um, I think he liked his, uh, he was very pleased with his Academy Award, but there's something about the French uh, Cannes Award that was it something d'or. Um, je parle français, mais je ne, <laughs> je ne, je ne me souviens pas le, le nom de la, le, le, the award. Um, he felt that she got him a lot of these awards and reinvigorated his career. And, and yes, she was abusive, but at least she was funny. <laughs> and she was funny. She could be very funny. I think that's the perfect place to end, unless you've got anything more now, have you? No, that's, that yeah. is a great ending, yeah. yeah. Well, David, thank you so much for joining us. This has been absolutely compelling and, and fascinating. I've enjoyed every minute, and I can't wait to, to, to listen to it again. Um, Thank you so much for taking the time to share your memories with us. Thank you very much, Matthew. Thank you, Noah. It's a pleasure. So just before our final song, Noah, do you have a Patreon update for us? I just want to say we are now in a golden age of guest postcard designs for <laughs> our Patreon subscribers. A little while back, I sounded the alarm that it was time for some new submissions, and I've been overwhelmed um, by beautiful designs, some from returning champions, artists who have designed postcards for us in the past. You'll get to see some of their uh, more recent work, and also a few new pens in the mix. Uh, I think we're, uh, at least through the first couple of months of next year, uh, we have beautiful new designs lined up, so there's never been a better time to subscribe at one of our top levels. And you can do that at patreon.com slash Marks Brothers Council Podcast, or you can go to Marks Brothers Council Podcast.com and click the Patreon button in the upper right-hand corner. Okay, so we are now at the end of another podcast, but David, before we let you go, uh, we do always ask our guests to choose the song that we play out with. So what would you like us to end this episode with? Well, I think uh, perhaps Matthew and, and Noah that uh, Hello, I Must Be Going, where she sings with Groucho together, Aaron, my aunt, and, and Groucho uh, sing Hello, I Must Be Going together. <laughs> Hello, I must be going I cannot stay, I came to say I must be going I'm glad I came, but just the same I must be going Stay a week or two. I'll say the summer through. But I am telling you, I must be going. by McFarland. Noah Diamond's book, Give Me a Thrill, The Story of Alsatias, is published by Beer Manor Media. To leave a comment and for more info about this and all episodes, visit us at marksbrotherscouncilpodcast.com. 
support the latest Marx Brothers and podcast news, follow us on X or Twitter or both. And join the fun with the largest and most vibrant Marx community online. A club that will have someone like you as a member. The Marx Brothers Council Facebook group. That's it for now.